Hi, everybody. Hope you're doing marvelously well. It is another Fact Friday. Yes, we're back in black for another Fact Friday. So we recently did a video, which is I'm looking at here, and we specifically asked for some Fact Friday questions. So let's start with this lovely question. Is it a good idea to invest in hardware EQs that mainly sound very musical and have rather wide filters to emphasize and or bring out the good things and then remove the rather annoying frequencies with plugins? That is an absolutely superb question because I actually think yes is the answer. So we're in the lovely Labarca studio here in the West Sussex countryside and they have a Focusrite dual equalizer there. And you can probably tell it doesn't, you know, it's got a it's got a, a cue there, which I imagine can get fairly tight so you can get in there. But the reality is, as you are quite rightly pointing out, most hardware EQs, not all, there are some really finite hardware EQs. Most of them are there to make global is a big word, but you know, more global EQ cuts and boosts. And they do have an inherent sound that we like. Then you have wonderful modern plugins that can get cues about this wide and can pull out a single offending frequency and seemingly not change the sound because, well, there can be dynamic EQs. They can follow the offending frequency as it moves around. So it just gets rid of that one spike. OX Soothe 2, of course, is a perfect example of a really smart plugin that can get rid of unwanted frequencies. So yes, yes, and yes. I think if you've got a hybrid setup where you have some Poltex style EQs with big, wide, beautiful sound to it, quite frankly, you know, boosting huge high end or low end frequencies. And then in the middle of doing that boost, it pulls up an unwanted frequency and then you get your fancy plug in and just pull that one out. That sounds like a win-win to me. It really does because hardware, can have transformers in it, it can have valves or tubes in it which add additional harmonics and all kinds of fun things. You can abuse your hardware, you can really hit it hard and create some saturation in there, some additional second and third harmonics and all these wonderful things. Warmth, yeah, I'm gonna use that word. All of these things that hardware does, and then you're correct. A plugin can come in and pull out some of those offending frequencies. So I think your question is really the answer should have just been yes. I think that's a great way of working. Now, of course, there are plugins that can emulate hardware and do a lot of that stuff too. And for many, many, many people getting started, with their DAW comes a handful of incredible EQ plugins that can do amazing things. So as much as I love and we all love hardware, don't discount the fact that you can actually really shape the sound rather beautifully using even the free plugins that come with your DAW. Ah, another good one, a drum mix question. I have one cymbal, a China type, that is significantly louder than the other cymbals. Yeah, go figure, China's, China's are like hitting very large dustbin lids. That's the way I think about them. You can tell I'm not a big fan. <laughs> is there a practical way to tame it? One thing we tried was moving it as far away from the overhead mics as possible. Getting a drummer to selectively reduce his power when going to that cymbal is difficult and inconsistent at best. Well, yeah, I mean, all joking aside, Chinas have a very that kind of aggressive, not particularly musical sound, but they add a lot of aggression to the music. They're great in rock tracks. So all joking aside, they can sound wonderful in the right track. But yes, typically, they're loud. They're incredibly loud. And your last point is very well taken. Sometimes the worst thing, you, well, not sometimes, almost always the worst thing you can do is hinder a musician especially somebody who's coming into the studio for the first time, a drummer that maybe isn't that balanced and doesn't know how to quite get their kit to really kind of be punchy on the kick and the snare and the toms and is overplaying the cymbals. Those things happen all the time. It takes years of being beaten up to become that drummer who can like smack the kick and the snare consistently and make those toms ring. And then when they go to cymbals, just keep them balanced. Trust me, I've worked with so many incredible drummers, even ones that have been working for 10 or 20 years that still haven't quite got that balance, you know? That's why we multi-mic these days, you know? You can mic anybody with one mic if they're incredibly balanced. It's kind of a thing. So in that situation, 
Yes, moving the symbol a little further away, but it could also be the same thing. You might put them off because they're now reaching further and they're used to it being here. What I've done with symbols that are too loud is I take paper towel, kitchen towel, whatever you want to call it, and tape that on the underside of the symbol. It can just deaden it just enough. Another thing people do is tighten that felt a little bit. So tightening the felt a little bit, putting some kitchen towel underneath, will get rid of some of that aggression. Ultimately, the best way is to let the drummer hear themselves. After you've done all those little things, they're probably still playing it a little bit too hard. Have them come into the control room and listen back. Because you want your artist, whoever it might be, whether it be the singer, the drummer, the guitar player, the bass player, whatever, the tambourine player, whatever it is, you want them to make those decisions on their own and for them to own those decisions. And quite often when you're the know-it-all producer and engineer going, you know what, son, you're playing your cymbal too hard. It's patronizing at best. You can say, hey, let's pretend the drummer's called Vinny. <laughs> say, Vinny, come in and listen to this. See what you think. Have them listen. Because if that China symbol is literally five times too loud for the rest of the kit, it's going to be pretty darn obvious. So yes, you can dampen down the symbol. You can do all kinds of tricks to bring them down. But the best way is to let them hear themselves. Let them understand themselves that there is an issue rather than being the wagging finger, know-it-all producer guy that says, oh, you're not doing this properly. Your job is to encourage and get the best results. And as you're pointing to, once again, in the last part of it, you don't want to make it so that you affect the way they play. You might affect it in as much as like have them reduce the amount they hit it, but you don't want them to be hesitant. You don't want a drummer sitting there going, oh, I'm a little afraid of how I'm playing at the moment. And the best way to do that is to encourage. So another thing you can do, one last tip, is have them listen to the performance and point out something amazing before highlighting the loud China symbol maybe in the bridge. Go to the verse, go to the chorus where something is absolutely amazing and say, wow, listen to your drum performance in this chorus. See how balanced it is. See how the cymbals just sit beautifully with the kick and the snare. Highlight that. Make them feel good about what they've done. Then play that bridge section and say, hey, do you think we could get that same kind of balance going on here? That is the best way to get a great performance. Compliment, find something that's good about what they do and ask for more of that rather than finding something bad and pointing that out. Here's another great question, another hardware orientated one. If I decided to move to the analog world, would the two bus be the wisest place to start as far as gear? Been thinking about building a 500 series chain. Yes, I think typically the handful of people I know that work hybrid predominantly use it on the two bus. Or maybe they're taking their vocal chain that they absolutely love and printing back through it. That happens quite a lot. I know for me, a lot of what I have done in analog on the vocals is hard to replicate in plugins. I've figured it out now, but for a while, I would always actually use an 1176 inserted on my vocal when I recorded a hardware one, even doing all fancy plugins and all the emulations, there was something about my external 1176, which was magic. Things like the vocal is something that still occasionally I look to outside of the box, but predominantly I agree with you. The two bus would be a wonderful, wonderful place to start. In fact, I agree so much with you that I get a little nervous putting more, any plugins on my mix bus because I feel like I've done all this incredible work to try and keep it big and open. And then suddenly I'm clamping down on my master bus and plugins, I don't know, I'm nervous about it. When I look over to a rack and I see several thousand dollars worth of hardware, I just think to myself, I'd rather be putting it through a pair of like, beautiful Poltex and putting a bit of 60 and a bit of 10 or 12K on the top than I would be, you know, taking some free downloaded or $17 plugin and boosting. And I, I just, it's just me, you know? So I agree. I think if you're going 500 series, Poltec themselves, Pulse Techniques, make, I believe, one of the finest sounding EQs. I'm blanking on the name, but go to Pulse Techniques, Poltex website, and they make these 500 series that we use all of the time. They're absolutely phenomenal. They're not cheap, but they're also not $5,000. They're about the thousand-ish kind of price range. So that's not cheap, I know, but you know they have an API 2520 in it. They are really amazing. They're incredible on the low end. 
and uh, Steve Jackson, who owns the company, will probably dislike me for saying this, but I actually use those on base over the rack mount versions, which are like $4,500. So it's like a quarter of the price. And on base, I prefer the 500 series. And many, many, many people have come to Spitfire, the old Spitfire, as bass players and walked away buying that exact 500 series for their mixing their bass. John Button, my old friend, who's the Who's bass player, is one of those. He went away and bought one. So when he does all of his tracking, he tracks through and mixes through one of those. So that could be a way of going. I agree with you. I think, again, don't go cheap. If you're going to do it, I don't mean spend five grand, but don't buy really inexpensive hardware. I almost feel it's the same thing as using a cheap, free, not very high quality plugin. You know, if you're going to do it, do it. At least go for something like the Pulse Techniques, the Poltex on for EQ, for compression. Of course, SSL have been doing an amazing job of dropping their prices recently. I think most of their 500 series is half to two thirds of the price of what it was a couple of years ago, and they've maintained those lower prices. So you could get an SSL 4000 bus compressor now for basically the same price as people are building clones, but you're gonna have the SSL name on it. And then of course, there are really good clones. Traditionally, it was always Allen Smart, the C2 was a popular one that many people used, but shop around. But yeah, SSL bus compressor, Parapoltex, that would be amazing on your mix bus. It's basically what I use. Phenomenal way of, you know, processing your two bus. Great question. All right, here is a very interesting question that I just posed to the uh, lovely people in this room. And I think it's a great question. How could I ask a better question in the Google search engine to obtain a more accurate search? Or what websites do you recommend to find slightly more technical and specialized review on specific producer or one of his tracks? We have this discussion all the time. Adam Steele is sitting behind this camera. Hello. Hot Pole Studios, he and I work together on a lot of stuff and Adam has a great channel. Just this guy, you're opening a door here because I have so many opinions on this. YouTube is a tough place. It's a tough place. When we review things, for instance, we don't get too much into the technical specs because I want to know how it sounds. And 99% of our reviews, I actually record something using the mic, using the interface, using whatever it might be, whatever piece of hardware, because I want you to be able to download the multi-tracks and actually hear, does it sound any good? If it's really thin and crappy sounding or distorts, then you might not want it unless you're looking for thin and crappy sounding distorted tracks, which actually sometimes can be quite fun, but there's plenty of cheap gear to do that. My point is, is like, I like to prove that within a certain, you know, price range, you can achieve amazing results. It's tough because I know lots of people love specs more than they love what the results actually sound like. They'll rather talk about like the specs and show a graph and maybe not realize that, you know, unless you're selling those graphs, you know, on the radio to the people listening in the car and that they're interested. You get my point. I'm all joking aside. It has to sound good. You have to be able to use it. And also sometimes what might be wrong with a piece of equipment is right for somebody else, like a certain amount of distortion. You know, back in the day, people didn't want to sell gear that had distortion. They wanted it to be a clean reproduction of the actual sound source because there were so many things in the chain, like the microphone had a tube and uh, a valve and transformers that were coloring the sound. And then it was going into a mic pre and a compressor that was also coloring the sound. And then it was going into onto a tape machine, which was also, you get my point. And so we were always trying to avoid that. Now we realize that those days were rather wonderful because they add pleasing artifacts or influence the sonic characteristic of the sound in a positive way. So for me, I would say, think about what the question is. What do you need? Are you just looking for technical specs? You can find those on most manufacturers' websites. They're relatively accurate. Sometimes they blur lines. So instead of maybe having a curve that looks like that, they just do a curve like this. It happens a lot. But the reality is you can get most of the specs of whatever sound pressure level the microphone could handle, for instance. Like, is it going to be good in front of, uh, you know, two full Marshall stacks? If it can only handle about 90 SPL, then probably not. 
But if you've got a microphone of 120 and above, which a lot of microphones can do now, you can handle a frickin' jumbo jet within reason. We're moving into a world now where there's really a lot of inexpensive equipment that has really great ability to reproduce sound accurately and has very low noise floor, so it isn't really adding any negativity to signals at a fraction of the cost, whether it be microphones, mic pre's, compressors, you name it. Gear is getting better, it's getting cheaper, and that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. So the specs can be important to make sure you're not buying a lemon, which is super noisy. I think other than that, I would personally just go with people that you trust and I don't mean just because they're negative about things, like I trust them because they hate something. No, go with people that actually use equipment, that have made records, that know what sounds good. That has always been a big attribute, you know? When I'm in a room with Bob Clearmountain and he's using a piece of equipment, I ask him why he uses it and what he uses it on. You know, he doesn't know what the frequency response of it is. Why would he? but he knows what it sounds great on, and he knows how to get a good sound out of it. That's far more important to me than maybe going, well, it's plus or minus 3dB. You know, that stuff is all good to an extent, but it doesn't necessarily mean it would be great for your purpose. If, however, it's like an interface, and you want to make sure it's got really low self-noise, that it has an incredibly huge dynamic range and reproduces all frequencies evenly, sure. You know who's good at that? Julian Clouser. I will demonstrate the stuff. Julian Clouser will give you the specs. Go and check out his channel. It's one of the best out there. Huge, huge fan of Julian Clouser. He's down listed down below in our um, in our channels that we recommend. You know, as is Adam and Christian Kohler and many others. And of course, our friend Ed Thorne also does very high spec stuff. There are guys that aren't getting paid a fortune to tell you that something's really good. They are literally just testing it properly. So for me, those are the two things. If I hear something that sounds great, I love it. If it sounds bad, I'm not going to recommend it. Then I can go to somebody like Julian Clouser, who's not testing it and recording with it at all, but he's specking it out. Put those two things together. Best of both worlds. You know how it sounds, you know whether it sounds good, and you know why it sounds good. Or why it sounds bad. Great question. Thanks ever so much for asking. And uh, yeah, of course, go to producelikeapro.com and sign up for the email list. You get a whole bunch of free goodies, but you also see that we do written reviews there as well. So here's the last question. It's a quick one. The question is, I would like to know if you wrote and mixed the music for plap opening and ending. Yes, it's me trying to write a rainbow song. Can you pass me one of those guitars? So if you think of Rainbow. Total Richie Blackmore. And ours is. So it's the same voicing. Yep. It's me doing my best Richie Blackmore impersonation. It's the same, it's the same notes, a different part. I grew up, Down to Earth came out when I was knee high to a grasshopper and I bought it on clear vinyl. Clear vinyl, it was an amazing record. It has Since You Be Gone and of course, All Night Long. Two absolutely classic songs with Graham Bonnet, the great Graham Bonnet singing. So, I wrote that guitar riff to do my Richie Blackmore impersonation. Thanks everybody for watching. I really, really appreciate it. Leave any other comments below and of course any future Fact Fridays, Frequently Asked Questions Fridays. Thanks everybody. So long, farewell, avidezayen, dovidezayen, adios, au revoir, so long, farewell, avidezayen, au revoir, adios, goodbye.